Moving swiftly on then, the final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 10757 in the name of Graham Day on Angus CAB publishes paper highlighting challenges faced by online benefit claimants. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I'd invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Graham Day, already on his feet, to open the debate. Mr Day, you have seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Presiding Officer, can I begin by thanking those SNP colleagues and Labour MSPs whose support for the motion has allowed us this opportunity to consider the paper produced by the social policy team of Angus Citizen Advice Bureau and the important issues highlighted within it. I also want to thank those members who have remained uh, behind to participate in the debate. Can I say at the outset that I am seeking to highlight the content of the report, not as a means of attacking the, the general actions of the DWP or Westminster as such, but to draw their attention to the serious practical impact that the digital by default strategy is going to have on some of the people most reliant on accessing benefits. Angus CAB's paper, Digitally Enhanced or Digitally Disadvantaged, lays out very clearly the challenges presented by the UK Government's digital strategy and its expectation that 80% of benefit applications will be completed online by 2017. And it highlights the fact that not even the DWP believe this is achievable, given they've recognised that only 30% of benefit claimants would have no difficulty moving to an online application. Process. In other words, more than two-thirds of claimants will encounter varying degrees of difficulty, yet within three years the aim is to have 80% embracing this approach. Now, I think I'm reasonably computer savvy, though my kids and constituency office staff might disagree, but even I find myself checking, double, sometimes triple checking, bookings or forms I've completed online. Imagine what it would be like for someone who isn't computer literate or techie confident and lifeline benefits are at stake. The DWP themselves have admitted that uh, those most likely to be claiming benefits, those on low income, those who are disabled or over 65, are in fact the very people who are very least likely to have access to the internet or indeed the ability to use it. And yet, this seems to have been disregarded in drawing up the new strategy. Now, of course, this in passing highlights a wider issue, a digital skills deficit which is spread all throughout Scotland. Only one third of those on a low income in our country have broadband access compared to 56% of comparable households in the rest of the UK. But while the issue of the digital deficit is one that needs to be addressed and the disparity between not only Scotland and the rest of the UK but different areas of Scotland um, has to be dealt with, let's focus for now on the issue under discussion and the UK Government's anticipation that such a large majority of benefit applications will be made online whilst offering no new support to help facilitate this. Understandably, it's this lack of support which concerns Angus Citizens Advice Bureau. Just 35% of Angus CAB's clients believe that they would be able to apply online for these benefits, leaving a large group of people relying on the services such as the CAB provide or their friends or their family to help with applications. Now, from 2011-12, the CABs across Scotland helped clients to complete an average 75 old-style paper benefit forms a day. Now, that help may have been required due to technical and confusing language on the forms or issues such as struggling with reading or writing. These problems will still be there with an online application. For anyone who experiences trouble reading or writing, or for instance the deaf community where often they do not use the written English language, moving the application uh, process online won't fix any of these problems. It will simply exacerbate them. Not only will those who are already struggling to fill in long, complex forms require help uh, to do so, uh, so too will those who do not have readily available internet access or indeed don't know how to use a computer. The digital by default strategy fails to make the application process easier for users. For the majority of claimants, it just makes it harder. And in referencing the deaf community, presiding officer, can I say that I've also been told that in order to reduce costs, the DWP are to be, where possible, telephoning clients to secure additional information or process applications. Well intentioned, perhaps, but where does that leave the hearing impaired? The actions of the DWP will undoubtedly pile pressure on local services, such as the CAB or libraries which offer internet access, as no further support or funding has been offered to help these services provide for the claimants, even though the UK Government recognises that they will need extra support. Of course, there is a move across society to have form filling done online, but it's about how you pursue that approach and how you cater for those who will fall through the cracks, surely. By way of example, Angus Council's preferred method of applying for housing benefit or council tax reductions is online. 
but they also offer a telephone and paper-based service. Revenue and benefit staff are available at four locations to assist with completing applications. And by appointment, this service can be extended to take in three other locations. Additionally, officers will, on request, visit people's homes. There's also access to digital skills programmes made available, uh, ranging from the very basic level upwards. That's a common sense approach. It's a compromise. It's flexibility. Angus CAB certainly believes itself to be under-resourced to meet the demand, which will undoubtedly arise by virtue of this strategy being pursued. Throughout the, the report, the CAB highlight previous cases which support this assertion. It appears that benefits claimants repeatedly are being punished for not having online access. For instance, two Angus CAB clients were sanctioned for not being able to access the job seekers' allowance services, which have already moved online, even though both uh, clients were vulnerable and had no knowledge of how to use a computer, let alone apply for jobs online. It's not only the change to the application pro process that will cause an upheaval for those in receipt of benefits, but also the fact that it's been paralleled with the rolling out of universal credit. As universal credit spreads across the country, increasing emphasis is being placed upon job searching and applications for those who currently receive a, a job seekers allowance. Not only will they have to apply for benefits online, they'll also have to search and apply for jobs online. And this approach signposts everyone to apply online, working with digital applications as the rule, not the exception. Needless to say, Angus CAB have examples of clients who have no access to the internet and very limited access to the telephone. As I highlighted earlier, how are the hearing impaired supposed to cope with applications being discussed or progressed by means of the telephone? I'm not saying that the phone approach won't be helpful to some, but the practice still does not entirely reflect the flexibility or the resourcing which is required here. While I accept that moving to an online benefit application process may have its benefits for some and should speed up the process for those who successfully manage to apply, the UK government's digital by default strategy, with its 80% target, is a non-runner for many. The strategy offers insufficient flexibility for those who will struggle with the online application, while the DWP offers no support to the local services which are bound to experience an influx of people who are struggling with the new application system. For me, this is a badly thought out strategy. The UK government has recognised the difficulties it will cause, yet has not provided adequate means of alleviating these. That needs to change. Otherwise, cynics might wonder whether adopting this approach is just another method of reducing the benefits bill, regardless of the human cost. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call on Annabel Ewing to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I too congratulate my colleague uh, Graeme Dane for securing this important debate this afternoon. And although this debate makes a specific reference to a report published by Angus CAB on the challenges being faced there as far as those requiring to make online benefits applications are concerned, from my work on this Parliament's Welfare Reform Committee, I know that similar challenges are being faced by many, many benefit claimants across Scotland. And what is the key issue here, Presiding Officer? Well, I would submit that the magnitude of the challenges being faced stem from the UK Government's determination uh, to force people to make online applications and to maintain online activity with respect to their benefit entitlement, even in circumstances where the citizens concerned have no or low computer skills or have no access to the internet at all. This flows, as we have heard uh, from the UK Government's so-called digital strategy, which includes an expectation that some 80% of benefits applications will be completed online by 2017. However, Angus CAB and many other CABs across Scotland have expressed or, or experienced concern about this, as we've heard, digital by default approach to the welfare system. And indeed, in the report of Angus uh, CAB at page two, and I quote, they're concerned uh, that this approach uh, would exclude some of the most vulnerable and marginalized members of society from accessing the very services they rely upon. Indeed, without at the same time taking or promoting measures to ensure that such citizens are not left offline and behind, what is the efficacy of the UK government's current approach? How will it in and of itself do anything to help improve online skills and access? And the fact of digital exclusion and the implications that it has for the receipt of benefits to which people are in fact entitled has been the subject of discussion at the Welfare uh, Reform Committee. And one area of particular concern and a point highlighted in the Angus CAB report is that of the impact on those who are required to maintain a job search online activity. And as the Welfare Reform Committee of this Parliament highlighted in its uh, fourth report entitled 
uh, interim report on the entitled uh, New Benefit Sanction Regime, Tough Love or uh, Tough Luck, and which was published on the 11th of June 2014. One of the weaknesses in the current sanction system was identified, and I quote from para 6 at page 2, as a failure to appreciate that many people on benefits do not have the necessary IT skills at day one to utilise the DWP's universal job match facility or, or other IT uh, technology. This indeed was a point raised during the committee's inquiry, for example, by uh, One Parent Families Scotland. Uh, uh, and I quote, they said, issues of digital access are being ignored so that sanctions are being applied to loan parents who don't have access to a PC, don't have broadband, or don't have the online skills required by John Job Centre Plus to meet job search uh, requirements. Um, also, uh, cost issues have been identified, <clears throat> and again quoting from this report at paragraph 95, at page 19, Citizens Advice Scotland said, some clients are unable to meet job-seeking requirements because they cannot afford the cost of their job search. Often, this is the result of a previous sanction. So the question arises as to what support there is to be made available in order to move claimants online. And further to the uh, CAB report from Angus, uh, Cab, there is reference at page 5 to the DWP having advised that claimants should inter alia contact their local job centre to get help with claiming online or to get access to the internet. But, presiding officer, I have absolutely no confidence that that is happening in any significant way. And it therefore begs the question as to where is the safety net for these vulnerable people as far as the welfare system is concerned. In conclusion, presiding officer, surely it is time that the UK government had a rethink, not least in light of its own lamentable track record as far as the setting up and development of computer systems is concerned. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And I now call on Jackie Bailey to be followed by Christine Graham. Presiding officer, can I start by congratulating Graham Day on securing this debate and for the content of his speech to the chamber this evening. Um, whilst he may consider himself computer savvy and techie confident, new phrases I'm learning all the time, I merely note that by his own admission, the people closest to him might possibly disagree. Um, but let me also congratulate Angus CAB on producing their report, highlighting the challenges faced by online benefit claimants. We do live in an increasingly online world. We pay our bills online, we can get our shopping online, we can make travel arrangements online, but you know, it isn't for everybody, and we shouldn't lose talking to people face to face. Graham Day is absolutely right to point out the need for alternatives to just doing things online. Um, it is correct to say that the DWP expect people to increasingly make their claims online. Indeed, the UK government's digital strategy expects that 80% of all benefit claims will be made online by 2017, yet the rate of progress is extremely slow. For job seeker applica JSA applications alone, where they said they would reach 80% by September 2013, just last year, um, they woefully fell short of that target. It was 10% in March 2011, 19% um, in March 2012, a long way off from the target they set themselves. And there are a number of reasons for this. Firstly, even the DWP admit that their claimants are less likely to use the internet. 72% of disabled people are online compared to 85% of non-disabled. 59% of people over the age of 65 are online. That leaves a huge number that aren't. Access to online services can often be limited by income. Ofcom found that one in three households earning less than £17,500 had broadband. So if you're older, in poor health, have a lower income or less education, you're more likely to be offline and yet these are the very people who make the most use of government services and will need assistance. An approach that expects all of those who claim benefits are in, in search of employment to have the necessary IT skills will not only put them at risk of being sanctioned, as other members have described, but further marginalise them within their own communities. There is nothing being done by the UK government to actually help improve IT skills, just a closing down of alternative means of claiming. Now that will put extraordinary pressure on public and voluntary services to help people with claim forms. Citizens Advice Bureau dealt with 19,460 
three benefit, I had to make sure I got that right, benefit form completions in 2011-12. That's likely to increase and CABs are not funded to meet that level of demand. It's equally a problem for local authority advice services because access to computers in libraries may be helpful, but there are challenges there. A lack of privacy, often a lack of support staff and short time limits on computers. Now, there are three local authority universal credit pilots in Western Berkshire, North Lanarkshire and Dumfries and Galloway. They're already raising significant misgivings. Councillors in these areas are already warning, and I quote, that online applications must not become the preferred method for accessing the benefit system, and alternative methods must not be made more difficult to force people to go digital. Another said, it takes around 90 minutes to complete an online JSA application form. People cannot fill out a 36-page form on a mobile phone, and many people don't want to upload very personal information on a public computer in a library. There is even a question as to whether the pilots will have had time to be properly evaluated by the time of the introduction of universal credit. The UK government cannot assume that people have the skills to access the internet or indeed the opportunity to do so. Simply asserting that benefit applications will be have to made online is just not good enough and fails to address the practical barriers faced by many benefit claimants. In coming to a close, presiding officer, it is a wrong-headed policy to try to push people to apply for benefits online. It fails to reflect the reality of people's lives and the impact that it will have on public and voluntary services. I thank Angus CAB again for drawing this to our attention and for Graham Day in bringing this debate to the Chamber. But ultimately, the UK Government need to change their approach to some of the most vulnerable in our society and help them to make claims rather than put artificial barriers in their way. Thank you. Now I call on Christine Graham to be followed by Alex Johnson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I add my congratulations to Graham Day in securing this debate on a very important topic and indeed congratulate Angus CAB and agree, Jackie Bailey, what you've said about this being a wrong-headed policy. At this time, when we see an assault on benefits claimants, indeed what to me amounts to a persecution of those who put themselves back on the referendum voters' roll, now hunted for even historic poll tax, who would want to be a benefits claimant today? Everything's made tough for you. Complex forms often to be completed, as others have said, by those least capable of completing them. And frankly, without the CAB and other advice centres, where would these claimants be? Recently, I confirmed that nearly a quarter of a million Scottish pensioners were claiming pension credit. And even then, one third of those entitled were not claiming. And goodness knows how they were making ends meet. I checked today. Together with guidance notes, the, the pension credit form runs to 41 pages. You need a PhD in form filling to complete that. And I speak as a woman who found she was going to get taxed for a van she didn't actually own when she completed her own inland revenue tax form. I didn't even get that right. And that was pretty straightforward. And how often have you tried to fill in an online form to be told to go back and complete some line that hadn't been completed properly? So I can understand why sometimes it takes 90 minutes. Now, add to that complexity the UK government's strategy that 80% of benefits applications should be completed online, as others said, by 2017, and it makes it even more difficult for people. I shall keep to the demographics touched on by Jackie Bailey from the CS report offline and left behind, as it's clear that in the age range 60 to 74, 59% never use a computer, and at 75 plus, that rises to 75%. Think of the pension credits not claimed at the moment and how that would impact. In the Scottish Borders, part of which I represent, the age group 60 to 74 represents nearly 20% of the population compared to the Scottish figure of just over 15%. In Midlothian, this age group is also higher than the Scottish average. In the 75-plus group in the borders, it's also above the Scottish average, 9.9% uh, to the Scottish average, 8%. So in my patch, some 30% are over 60, and a good queen of them will be entitled to pension credit and now supposed to do this online. Compounding this is internet connection at home for all claimants groups. Just 50% have it in the borders 
and similarly for Midlothian. So they're expected to travel somehow, somewhere to publicly access the internet. So my question, indeed that of the CAS is, how is this that 50% is to become 80% and how is that to be achieved in an aging population? Frankly, as I've said, I can see that one third not claiming the pension credit rising. And I can foresee injustices for those who, for various reasons, find using the internet overwhelming. While I support cutting out bureaucracy, this cannot be at the expense of the vulnerable, the elderly, and I consider the UK government should embark on assessing how difficult accessing the benefits system is just now before imposing another hurdle. In the meantime, the UK government should simplify those forms for the pension credit. For me, if you have to have working examples, which they have on the pension credit form, then that's an admission that your form is too complex for the start. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Alex Johnston to be followed by David Torrance. Uh, could I begin by thanking Graham Day for bringing this uh, report before Parliament uh, with his motion tonight. Uh, can I can also pay tribute to the work that's been done by the Angus Citizens Advice Bureau in bringing forward the paper which they describe on the front cover as a discussion paper produced by Angus Social Policy Team part of this Angus Citizens Advice Bureau. A discussion paper is vital uh, at this time and very valuable in promoting this debate. As we look at the issue of digital uh, exclusion, it, it is important to remember that those of us who do have access to the internet uh, and make use of it regularly have a tremendous advantage over others. Many of the things we buy, some of the things we sell, many of the services we access are cheaper if you have access to the internet. It is therefore the case that there is a natural advantage to those of us who can access the internet and consequently a natural and converse disadvantage for those who do not have that digital connectivity. And there are a number of reasons why digital connectivity may be a problem. As has been highlighted in this debate already, in many of our rural areas, uh, the access to, to broadband is not all it could be. And as a consequence, many of those who live in our geographically most marginal communities will struggle to have access to the internet by any means, having no broadband connection and certainly in many areas having no mobile connection that could substitute for it. But what we're talking about here specifically are those who are not only excluded by one means or another from the advantages of internet up, uh, access, but also who are now going to be expected to make applications for support by that means. Now, those, some of us from the... Uh, some of us from the, the committee, the, the Welfare Reform Committee, have had the advantage of going to Glasgow to the place where the pilot is being run and talking to some of the people who are involved. And it has been reassuring to some extent. The 80% target which has been placed uh, on by 2017 is, let me reassure you, not a target that will be achieved by simply dropping people off uh, until the 80% is reached. The fact is that if the 80% target can't be reached, then other means will have to be found to reach those who cannot uh, get online. And we spoke to individuals who are responsible for running individual accounts in the pilot uh, and who take the opportunity to look at the online applications that have been taken, but also are responsible for contacting those who have failed to complete the form adequately or made some error that requires further contact. In fact, it became fairly clear uh, during that visit that many of those who are responsible for running the pilot on a day-to-day -day basis understand only too well the disadvantages that are coming along. The truth is that the universal credit, when it is uh, fully implemented, will actually bring some tremendous advantages for claimants, giving huge flexibility, but they must be able to access their account. That's why I am supportive of those who are expressing grave concern over those who would have an advantage if they could connect online, but are unable to do so. I think the Citizens Advice Bureau have highlighted a key problem, and we must start to deal with this at every level. 
That means finding adequate support for those who can give the training and assistance locally, providing the equipment necessarily, if in our libraries, then in a much more secure manner, providing the support through local government where it can be effectively funded by some other means, and above all, finding the resource within uh, DWP budgets to ensure that a little spent in the right place results in the savings that they would like to achieve long term. I believe that there is a great deal to be achieved by pursuing this target, but this target must be implemented in a, an effective and understanding way that produces these results for the benefit not close, only of please. the DWP, but for the claimants as well. Thanks so much. I now call on David Torrance, after which we move to the closing speech of the Minister. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to thank Graeme Day for bringing forward this motion for debate and to emphasise the importance of the issue he has raised in doing so. The paper produced by Angus Citizens Advice Bureau highlights the major problems with the UK Government's digital strategy and its aims for 80% of benefit applicants to be made online by 2017. These issues will affect benefit claimants across Scotland as universal credit continues to be rolled out throughout the regions. And I am certain that the claimants in my own constituency will face many of the same difficulties as those encountered by CAB clients in the Angus area. One of the most pressing problems facing claimants making their benefit application online is the lack of access to the internet. Citizens Advice Scotland found in a 2013 survey of its CAB clients who had benefit issues that just 54% of respondents had an internet connection at home. This suggests that almost half of the clients surveyed would have to seek alternative access to the internet in order to make their claim for benefit online. While some, many, while some people may be able to rely on friends or family who have a computer, those unable to do so must turn to publicly available facilities. Most local authorities provide such facilities in libraries or community centres. However, many of these are limited in numbers, as well as in the terms and venues of opening hours. In my constituency, there are internet facilities available in local libraries. However, other than these, options are limited. This is one of the reasons behind the newly launched Olive Branch Cafe located within Benneke Church in Kirkcaldy. The Olive Branch provides an internet cafe allowing free internet access for people in the local community. Whilst invaluable to benefit claimants, the service is limited to the current opening hours of the cafe. Even if these kinds of facilities are more readily available, some claimants may have difficulties in getting to them. This could be due to mobility, reasons of cost or availability of transport. Therefore, internet access remains a major obstacle for many benefit claimants. Practical access aside, many claimants lack the skills and or confidence to use the internet. One of my constituents who was made redundant last year after 35 years of working in a manual job. He struggles to use the internet due to lack of IT skills and when he found himself unable to perform job searches online, his job seeker's allowance was sanctioned. This is surely a sign of things to come, particularly for the older generation who are inevitably less likely to possess IT skills of our young people who have grown up in the digital age. CAB's 2013 survey found that 47 per cent of respondents citing skills and confidence as a barrier to applying for jobs or benefit online were aged between 45 to 59, and 22 per cent were aged 60 to 74. These factors can make applying for benefits online a very daunting task. Under current UK Government's digital strategy, benefit claimants may be sanctioned should they fail to perform tasks online. I have witnessed firsthand how some of my constituents have been affected by unreasonable and disproportionate sanctions. One of my constituents who was recently sanctioned due to failing to attend an appointment at his local job centre, despite having notified them in advance that he would be attending his father's funeral that day. Although this sanction was reconsidered and later reversed, my constituent had to face a period of weeks in interim awaiting the outcome of his appeal with no income whatsoever. He came to me with no money or food for electricity. Bear in mind that the majority of people in receipt of benefits are some of the poorest in our society and that already they are faced with the impact of billions of Westminster imposed cuts to a welfare budget. The DWP's digital by default strategy is likely to lead to a growing number of sanctions and consequently a higher prevalence of incidents like these whereby claimants end up in dire straits with nowhere to turn for alternative sources of income. It is abundantly clear that the UK Government's target of having 80% of benefits claims made online is completely unworkable, and that it has unfairly penalised those who face challenges in using the internet, be it due to a lack of access, skills or health. 
This is likely to have a knock-on effect on other local services, which will find themselves under increasing pressure to deal with those struggling to meet the digital demands placed upon them by the DWP. I wholeheartedly support Vemde's motion and call for a review of the UK Government's 80 per cent target at the earliest earliest opportunity. Many thanks. I now call on the Minister uh, to wind up the debate on behalf of the Government. Ms Burgess, you have seven minutes or thereby, please. Okay, thank you, Presiding Officer. And like others, I would also like to congratulate Graeme Day for bringing this issue forward as a member's debate. And I also commend Citizens Advice Bureau in Angus for their uh, discussion paper. It is an excellent paper and it has highlighted some very particular issues um, faced by claimants as a result of the, the UK Government's um, digital strategy. And the digital delivery of ben benefits is something that everyone who has spoken about here uh, tonight are concerned about. I think there is an absolute recognition of the difficulties it is causing for many vulnerable people. But we need to be specific in this because what I find concerning is that the way that the DWP is choosing to deliver the benefits through the digital channel, digital itself is not the problem. Um, and, and I, very early on, when this was announced by the UK government, I raised this issue uh, with Lord Freud uh, in one of my meetings with him that I saw this as being an issue that is going to impact on vulnerable people. And I expected that the DWP would, in some way, uh, provide support and financing to help people get over the hurdle or get access to um, the digital equipment and access to. to, to the, the computers as well. But I've said before in this chamber, we're not a parliament of Luddites, there, but there's no doubt about it. Digital is absolutely the way of the future. And in the future and now as well, efficient and responsive public services delivered online are what most of us in society will expect and demand. And my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Culture and, and External Affairs, recently published a digital participation strategy which commits us to building a national movement for change that works tirelessly to build a world-class world digital nation in which everybody, regardless of where they live or the circumstances in which they find themselves, can embrace digital technology with confidence. It sets out the work we are doing in partnership with the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations and signatories of our Digital Participation Charter to provide courses that will help improve digital skills, mentors that will give people confidence and financial support to organisations and community groups that people trust to support them on their digital journey. The comprehensive nature of this strategy and the cross-ministerial support it enjoys gives me the confidence that people in Scotland will be better placed than most to acquire the skills and confidence that the modern world increasingly demands. But where there is a problem, I think, is when the DWP is railroading people down a digital route simply to say we'll have 80 per cent people uh, making their applications um, digital by default is when very obviously in many cases it's not the be best option for them. And some of the stories in the discussion paper and from other sources that I've heard across Scotland are quite shocking. And we've heard some today um, and I hope it's not going to be an indication of how universal credit is intended to be delivered. But I have to say, some of the examples that we've heard, uh, like Christine Graham talking about pensioners and uh, David Torrance here talking about somebody who worked working for 35 years of their life, never needed to use digital strategy. To lose your job in those circumstances is a big enough trauma for someone, but to then not be able to claim the benefits that they're entitled to or take part uh, in applications online because they don't have the skills to use the internet is just a double whammy for someone. It's absolutely um, disgraceful that people have to go through that. And I think Jackie Bailey touched on the point of face-to-face. -face. There are always going to be people, no matter how digitally um, technophobia, or how clever we are, digitally advanced we are, there will always be people who are going to need the face-to-face -face advice because filling in a form is not just always about ticking boxes. You've got to understand the answers that have been put in the form. And I can certainly say that from many years in the advice sector, unless the right questions are asked of the individual, had they to fill in the form themselves, they would have done it wrong. 
They, they, they don't always know what benefit they're on, what income uh, that they're getting, and just filling that in incorrectly in a form could put them out of getting benefits for some time and then getting all that sorted out. This is people without the means to live. And I think all the members, Graham Day and others, have, have highlighted that the people who are going to be most affected by this are those on low incomes, living in deprived areas, having a disability, long-term health conditions, numeracy uh, or literacy difficulties, and also those that have just never actually ever had to use a computer. And these are the very people we would expect a welfare state to be there for them. And I say to the DWP that these people deserve a benefit system that meets their needs rather than one that only meets an arbitrary target to get 80% of claims online. And I know that this figure has caused some concern and it's because of these challenges that the Scottish Government is funding a variety of projects aiming to enhance digital skills and improve access. Our Welfare Reform Resilience Fund supports several digital projects, for example, the localised support project in Fife, which is recruiting local people to help build uh, IT capacity and delivering a bespoke community bus to take online service to, services to outlying communities. The Shetland Rural IT project, which aims to develop individual IT, ITV skills and their access to the internet throughout rural Shetland. And there's obviously very specific barriers in rural areas, some which were mentioned already, uh, but there are also issues in urban areas, particularly in Glasgow, Clyde and Lanarkshire, where we know that broadband uptake is much lower than the Scottish and UK average. And we have to remember that many, many people cannot afford to have broadband in their home. It is not, uh, it, for some people, we take it as something that's almost a necessity. For others, it's even more than a luxury. It's just something they can't even uh, contemplate having that, the money to spend on it. And Jackie Bailey mentioned that for many people, their only internet access is a mobile phone. And we all know nobody could apply for a benefit or fill in a form on a mobile phone. So that's why in, in some way we're funding the Glasgow Libraries project, £200,000 over a two-year period to promote local community-based access to computers, fitting new IT kit, making Wi-Fi available and providing relevant skills and development training. There are some signs, and many speakers have mentioned, that the DWP have now recognised that there will be challenges for many claimants and of the need that they require assistance to be provided to help them through transition to a new system. So we don't question that a digital delivery of public services, including benefits, is something for the 21st century. But what we do question and continue to raise with the DWP is the implementation of that service and the intent of the welfare reforms behind it. Many thanks. And I now close this meeting of Parliament. Thank you all.